Greetings, Victory family and friends. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we rejoice and are glad in it. My name is Paul, and I'm privileged to serve as pastor of Victory Church, and I'm so glad that you've decided to tune in and worship with us today. Those who are in fellowship with Victory, uh, we love you and thank you for tuning in. Those who are friends of Victory and just choosing to join us today, we love you as well, and thank you for, for joining us. Uh, I want to say a, a thank you to all of you for your giving. Uh, you know, while I know that the, we primarily give out of a response to God for all he's given through his son to us, that which we did not deserve. I also recognize that we choose uh, through what local church we give as unto the Lord. And I want to say thank you for entrusting our stewardship of your finances uh, to worship our Lord with. And as you've worshiped uh, the Lord through your giving, we've been able to horizontally have some impact on our local community's needs. Um, particularly in this season, we've been really blessed, um, just blessed to significantly support uh, entities like the PB&J Fund, Loaves and Fishes, um, Charlottesville Area Community Foundation Emergency Fund for, for this season especially. And, and most recently, um, you know, the fire at Greenstone Complex displaced a number of families and we were able to uh, support them and helping them get back on their feet. And so thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for your giving and allowing us to partner with God in, in, in meeting the needs of our community. Uh, we are in an incredibly surreal time uh, still. Uh, just this past week, even, I learned of two people that I know who tested positive for the coronavirus. And I suspect that for you, in a variety of ways, this is becoming more and more personal every single day. And, uh, and it's, it is, it's just that. It's, it's, it's surreal. Um, and yet God is on the throne and his word is true. And I mentioned this past week, even in a devotional, which by the way, we're doing our best to push out some encouraging words rooted in scripture throughout the week on our Instagram and Facebook and YouTube pages. So please, uh, join us and engage us there. Uh, and I mentioned on one of the devotionals this past week, how God in many ways is almost like a parent or a coach or a teacher kind of wrapping his hands around us lovingly and saying, hey, 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 focus on me. Look at me. Give your attention to me. And kind of like the child who is in distress when, when a, in distress when a teacher or coach kind of pulls them in that same way, similar to how they begin to calm down, even when the circumstances around them maybe have not and maybe have even increased, but due to their focusing on that calming influence in front of them, they begin to calm Similarly, we, as we fix our attention on Jesus, as we listen to him, as we embrace him, we can also embrace the peace that passes all understanding, the hope amidst unrest that doesn't make sense, except that it is embodied in Jesus Christ. We too, as we allow our attention to be given to him, can embrace that which is supernatural, so that's an encouragement for all of us today to do amid circumstances that are not great and in many ways are getting worse. And as we do that, I, I do want to say that I too grieve. Uh, I grieve the losses, the, the myriad uh, the variety of levels of losses that, uh, that are being incurred in this moment. The loss, for example, of uh, not being able to visit loved ones who are living in elderly communities where uh, they're essentially on lockdown. I grieve that loss. I grieve the loss of, of physical life. Uh, there's a teacher in Loudoun County Public Schools, a uh, county in which I worked for several years, Susan Rokas, who passed away uh, this week. I grieve the loss of Susan and pray for all those close to her. Uh, for the pastors who have tested positive and some have passed away, the pastor uh, in my home state of New York, Reverend Isaac Graham, for example, I grieve his loss this past week. And I recognize even as we move through this and no doubt uh, get back to, if you will, sort of normalcy, that many won't be getting back to normalcy. Uh, the spouses of those I mentioned, those I mentioned especially, and the families of those I mentioned, they're not going back. And I just want to acknowledge and, and, and grieve, if you will, the losses that we have occurred and encourage you to do the same. Uh, 
It's not easy, and there's loss on a variety of fronts, as mentioned, to be grieved. And yet, I'm thankful for Jesus. Thankful for him. And I've always committed to uh, just being even careful how I approach him in these spaces. Um, not in an accusatory tone of why God, but, but saying, Lord, how do I reckon? How do I reckon with such loss in this space? Show me through your word how I can manage the tension of, of grieving the loss while simultaneously seeing you high and lifted up on the throne on which you still sit. The Prince of Peace, who you still are. The word of whom never returns void. And I'm thankful for words like 1 Thessalonians 4, for example, that says that we don't grieve as those who have no hope, which means we do grieve. We sit with, with what is a difficult space, if you will, but not as those who have no hope, that the hope of glory is in the boat with us. That ultimately God is coming back to bring back with him, Jesus, those who have fallen asleep. And Romans 8, 28, that tells us that he works somehow all things together for his good, for those who love him and are called according to your purpose. I don't see it, can't even wrap my hands or brain around it. But then again, if I could, you wouldn't be God. I would. And so in some ways, I'm happy that I can. I just know that we can grieve and have hope. And that's the encouragement today, to have hope as we grieve. And we can do so because of the hope of glory that lives on the inside of us. Can we just pray into that for a moment? Heavenly Father, thank you for being just that, a Heavenly Father, a Lord, a Savior on whom we can rely, in whom we can trust. Thank you for peace that passes all understanding. And I pray, according to 1 Peter 5 and 7, that we are able to cast, throw off the weights, the anxieties, the cares that can so easily burden us down. Help us to throw them off onto you and embrace your peace that does pass understanding, that doesn't make sense. Help us to embrace the hope that is only embodied in you in this season. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we, we are encouraged by his word, and we are uh, increasing uh, our faith according to his faithfulness that is great and never wavers. And so we're praying for you every single day, again, amidst the circumstances that we, uh, that we are, are, are simultaneously grieving the real losses while fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen? Amen. We're going to continue in the Word. We're pretty much already in it, but we're going to flip now to uh, the book of Genesis. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, chapter 26. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6, verse 12. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Love to talk to Jesus and, and love to talk to him with you. And, um, and back to the uh, 930 call that we've been doing every Sunday. Um, if you want to be a part of that, it's a it's a way that we can have together in a Zoom space to uh, to do just that. It's it's a privilege to call on Jesus together. Genesis chapter twenty six is what we're looking at, uh, verses one through six, uh, and verse twelve. Lord, just help us this morning as we study your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We've been in a we've been in a series before we read uh, entitled uh, Reconciliation. Uh, reconciled to God and each other, which if you heard the vision prior, you know that that is our vision here at Victory Church. Uh, and of course, during the season, we've we've adapted, if you will, adjusted, particularly in the last two weeks, uh, the messages to speak um, to the pandemic we find ourselves in while also highlighting a few points related to that that series title. And so we'll do the same, uh, the same today and prayerfully through God's word, we'll, we'll be encouraged and sharpened and edified as a result. Uh, Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 through 6, and verse 12. It reads this way. Now there was a famine in the land, besides the previous famine in Abraham's time. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. 
For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him. Keeping my commands, my decrees and my instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. Verse 12, Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The title of the message uh, this morning is Faith in Famine. Faith in Famine. And there are three points that I really want to highlight from this text today. The first is mimicking man might cause us to miss God. Secondly, firm faith forms firm families. And thirdly, plant where God calls us. There are incredible implications for famine. There is a widened sort of geographical space within which people are looking for, for food. That's, that, that's increasing in terms of how far they'll go to, to get it. Uh, there's a lot of movement on the part of people. And as such, it could lead to transmission of infections due to undernutrition and such. Um, there's a slowing down in agriculture or business, if you will. And possibly uh, the sort of progressive abandonment of those who are ill um, or those who are not able-bodied. And all of these very real, life-altering dynamics, no doubt, would knock on one's door of faith, that is, asking, is anybody home? Is anybody home? And in our text, it's certainly knocking on Isaac's faith door. This is the only narrative uh, in which Isaac is the main character. And this chapter uh, 26 of Genesis is all about Isaac. And its story is rather crucial in that it's speaking to the sort of the, the translating of the promise from one generation, Abram's generation, to Isaac's generation. And in the midst of adversity, uh, Isaac has some decisions to make. The adversity being by way of this famine, that's come to him and his his wanting to basically change locations, but God coming to him and giving him instruction, different instruction and direction and comfort along the way. And the first point toward that end, again, is mimicking man might cause us to miss God. Mimicking isn't altogether a bad thing, we should say. It, it, it's often what we tend to do when we're trying to emulate someone. Uh, there's somebody we admire, and so we tend to mimic them. I mimic my dad for a long time growing up and his his racquetball swing. I would try to mimic, uh, even as a kid with a drumstick or a banana, just how he might be preaching. I would mimic so much about him because I love him. I admired him. It's not all together bad. There are some ways, if you will, and paths forward that... Um, until we can really appreciate or understand the why behind their why, by, the why behind what they're doing, just allows us, if you will, to progress a bit toward the path. Until we do really understand the conviction and the why behind what it is that they're doing, as the old adage is says, uh, "Fake it until you make it." Uh, and so, mimicking isn't all that bad. And yet, every parent, every teacher, every educator um, knows that sometimes um, mimicking. Uh, can lead one astray. Um, a child will often mimic things you don't even know that they're mimicking. Um, and this is where the illustration will remain somewhat vague, but I know <laughs> there are definitely times where uh, my child or children will, will say something or do something and uh, my eyes will get really wide and there's nothing like the mimicking of a child, mimicking of a child that will help you to change your behavior quickly. I'll give you one. I love cereal. Breakfast, Lunch and dinner, I can do it. And yet when my kids say, can I have cereal for dinner or lunch and bread? I'm thinking, what? And then I think, oh, they're mimicking some behavior that they see. Having no idea that daddy actually wants to try to curb that behavior. And so there are times where mimicking can lead some others astray. 
And Isaac right now is in a very similar condition in this text that his daddy was in. His father Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis displayed incredible faith that is that is a popular faith, if you will, or a popular story in that God said to him, go where I'm, I'm going to show you the land to go to, Abram, go. And Abram responded by simply going, not knowing where God was going to take him. And 10 verses in, though, verse 10 of chapter 12, Isaac then does something that isn't so representative of that same faith. He chooses, after a famine comes in the land, the same land that we're talking about here in the 26th chapter with Isaac. In the face of that, he's basically like, peace, I'm out. Famine hit, I have no time to, to even, I'm, I'm gone. I need something to eat. Same person who displayed incredible faith on the front end of chapter 12 is now sort of displaying a head scratching behavior. And I wonder if there's any human being watching this who might relate. I know of a friend who is watching uh, a lot of Netflix these days and shelter in place. And um, one of the shows this friend stumbled across has to do with couples who are getting to know each other without ever seeing each other. And, and, and then they end up proposing to each other without ever seeing each other. And then they see each other and they spend time with each other. And what, what, what this friend tells me about the show is that then they start saying, wait a second, hold up. I didn't know you were that crazy. Didn't know you were that much in debt. Didn't know that you were white or black or that young or that short. I didn't know that. I'm out. That incredible faith I had on the front end. Yeah, well, the famine has come. I'm out. Abram, in many ways, had incredible faith. But in this space of when the famine hit, decided, peace, I'm out. Didn't deny God or anything like that. But he did in this moment forget. God and forget to consult with him. Still a man of faith, but made a head scratching mistake as many of us do. And Isaac in this text appears like he's about to do the same thing. Heading to, to Gerar, which many scholars believe was kind of on the way, on the in the trek, if you will, on down to Egypt, which is where his daddy went, where there was plenty. And it was there, it says, the Lord appeared to him. In verse two, again, mimicking man might cause us to miss God. And in order for us not to fall prey to just mimicking men, we have to be well positioned, as Isaac clearly was, to see and hear God when he appears and speaks to us. Isaac was following the same path, had gone before Abimelech, uh, uh, the king in, 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 uh, of the Philistines in Gerar, exactly what Abram did, though it was a different Abimelech a hundred years earlier, and, and Abimelech was a common name for kings of, uh, of the Philistines, but Yet in the same spot, but but finds himself hearing and seeing God. And we talked about on another devotional just how we position ourselves to hear well of God such that we aren't just mimicking men. And those five ways that the word becomes a part of us such that we can be positioned well are hearing, reading, studying, memorizing, and meditating on the word of God daily. If we're to see God when he appears as Isaac did and hear God when he speaks to us, it would behoove us to become familiar with what he looks and sounds like. And we do that by nothing other than getting in his word every single day. And so here Isaac has God appear to him. And he says to, to Isaac, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. And verse 3 says, stay in this land. I think what's important to note here is that God says, nor does anything about the famine. And if I could just make some, some application across a broad spectrum here. Uh, if we're thinking about reconciliation, for example, your spouse may continue to smack while they eat. Your male boss may continue to cut you and every female employee off when they attempt to contribute in a meeting. Your ministry team partner may even dismiss or minimize your input or, or uh, consider it as outdated, archaic, old school, not relevant to today's community's needs. It doesn't say anything or do anything about the famine, as it were. On the front of daily challenges that we're all experiencing, people continue to test positive for the coronavirus. 
And while many thank the Lord are surviving it, and we praise the Lord for that and pray that more will continue to survive it, we know that many are not. And we know that medical professionals are walking into these spaces with safety protocols not in place as they know it should be or being grossly underprepared in terms of the infrastructure of our health system. And, and knowing this, they're walking in every single day. There's nothing, if you will, that seems, God, you're saying about the famine or doing about the famine. He said nothing about the famine to Isaac. And why doesn't he? He's God, right? As I shared earlier, I don't know why. I can't say why. All I know is that his mercy and his grace is abundant. It's sufficient. He is, as referenced earlier, still sitting on the throne. Can't explain why for some reason I'm protected from harm and others aren't. Can't explain why my dad is going through stuff in terms of health challenges that others are not. I can't explain much of it except to say, God, you're on the throne. And you're saying in many ways, like you said to Isaac here, stay in this land. He doesn't do anything about the famine, but he says, stay the course, Isaac. Have faith in famine. Because, second point, firm faith forms firm families. Say that 10 times fast. Firm faith forms firm families. A faith that acknowledges real challenges, absolutely, but also says, I believe in my God to do exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask or think. Ephesians 3 and 20. And not just for me, but for generations to come. And while this absolutely applies to biological families, it also applies to us as spiritual family. Your firm faith forms the firm faith of our community. It is why I referenced a bit earlier at our 930 uh, uh, discipleship moments that we have prior to this that uh, we have now just opened up. So if you're interested, uh, you can submit a connect card through our app and we'll be happy to bump up our plan to have as many join us on that call because all that we do is share testimonies so that the firm faith of, of some can inform or form the firm faith of our collective family. And then we pray on the back end for the pressing needs of our community so that when we hear those prayers answered, we can come back and express those testimonies of faith so that the firm faith can form the firm faith of our families in our community. And not just for us, but for generations to come. Yes, our individual study and understanding humor, hermeneutics and exegesis is so great, but it is to form firm faith of our family. Stay the course. And to encourage Isaac, he says in verses three and four, I will be with you. How many know that it's, it's enough for him to just be there with you? disciples in Matthew 8, as I referenced earlier, in the boat with Jesus, the waves were overcoming the boat. And Jesus is like, I'm here. Why are you afraid? It's enough for him to just be with you, Gideon, he tells too. I am with you, mighty warrior. Go. Apostle Paul, we know he dealt with some craziness, shipwrecked and other things. Don't be afraid. I am with you, Paul. Go. It's enough for him to just be with us. But he doesn't stop there. He goes further, even when he's already done enough. And he says, I will be with you. I will bless you. For to you and your descendants, I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father, Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. And then check this out. He says, because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions. And so lest I be accused of just kind of leaving Abraham out there with, uh, you know, kind of out there hanging out to dry, given his poor decision in Genesis 12, 10, it's because of his obedience that God is honoring the promise to further generations. And yes, I hope that's encouraging to you because the truth of the matter is all of us are making mistakes all the time and he can still and will do so much through you and your obedience to impact generations to come. Now Isaac has the opportunity to also join his faith and continue in perpetuity the promises to the generations. And whatever happens to us in life, whatever challenges come our way, whatever harm we face, whatever the difficulty, COVID-19, infidelity, uh, uh, backstabbing, whatever it is that comes our way, our firm faith in God forms 
the firm faith of our family for generations to come. And particularly our firm faith in God in the midst of famine forms the firm faith of our families. And I'm convinced that Isaac, he was actually in a really good position to avoid the misstep of, of mimicking man at the cost of mimicking, uh, at the cost of missing God because there was enough that he had seen on the part of his father's obedience. There was enough that Abram had done his obedience in leaving and going to a land that God was going to show him. He was well positioned, if you will. He had seen the faithfulness of God in his father's life enough that even though there were some missteps, again, we can be encouraged through this. Isaac was still very much in position to make a good decision. God is a redeemer by nature. And I hope you hear that because many times we can fall prey to a woe is me. And here's a prime example of how even in the midst or in spite of our mistakes and missteps, God will speak in and through us for generations to come. And yes, maybe it'll be hundreds of years like Abram. It was hundreds of years later when the, 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 the promised land, the land of Canaan was given, but it was kickstarted by his obedience. And that could be you and I in our own respective Life walks for generations to come. Isaac had an on-ramp, if you will, thanks to the obedience of his father. And yet he still had a choice, as do you and I. And in verse 6, he made one. It says, so Isaac stayed. Is anybody willing to have faith in the midst of famine? Hope amidst despair. Peace amidst chaos. And I'm not just referencing the self-help or the behavior modification, though I consume that literature. It has its place and it is useful. I'm talking about refreshing, hitting that refresh button on the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. The author and finisher of our faith. The one whose words never fail. Isaiah 40 and 8 says the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God endures forever. I imagine a people of God, regardless of circumstance, regardless of famine, having firm faith, not missing God due to our mimicking man and having firm faith that forms the faith of our families. And third, as I close, also planting where God has called us. Isaac, in the next several verses of this chapter uh, between uh, verses 7 and 11, actually does uh, mimic some behavior of his dad that wasn't, it was kind of another head scratcher. He's, he's gone before Abimelech and Gerar, and he tells them, just like Abram said about Sarah, Isaac says about Rebekah, that's my sister. She's a beautiful woman, and he thought, they're going to see that beauty, and if they want her, they're going to take me out to have her. So he said, she's my sister. And then Abimelech saw him whispering sweet nothings in her ear and said, that's not your sister. Why did you tell us that? And he ordered everybody, stay away from her. So in those verses, Isaac did mimic some of the head-scratching behavior of his father, but God was still with him. And in verse 12 of chapter 26, it says, he planted crops in that land where God told him to stay. And that same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. Whatever the famine that we find ourselves in, and certainly right now all of us share at least one that we that we are enduring in these very surreal times that we're living in. But whatever other famines of life you find yourself in or have found yourself in, finances, health, relationships, whatever it is that would tempt us to mimic the course of action of man, fear, hopelessness, angst, resentment, bitterness. If God has called you to a place and you end up in a famine, plant where you are. Couples, that might mean that you plant in the midst of the famine of your relationship. Pick up, pick up uh, uh, The Meaning of Marriage by Tim Keller. Even if it's just you reading it because your spouse wants nothing to do with, with reading that book with you. Pick it up. Pick up Henry Nguyen's Wounded Healer. Even if you're wondering and trying to figure out how in the world, given my suffering, am I now going to be there for someone else. Pick up the best book on every topic there is. The Word of God. Look through the Psalms and see how we lament and pray and praise if you're struggling with how we talk to Jesus. 
read Paul's epistles and see just what it looks like for us to live in unity. Start a small group, even though you might feel like imposter syndrome is going to overwhelm you. Plant where you are. And watch God through your individual and our collective faith. Watch him bring about a harvest that only he could in what was supposed to be famine.